Hello, everybody. Welcome to class nine, Gestalt Theory and Neuroaesthetics. Really getting deep into the class now. All right. So from the syllabus, uh, reading this week, Architectural Approach to Level Design, Chapter 9, uh, Storytelling in Game Spaces, and Pattern Language, Pick One Pattern. Notice there's no recommended reading. Uh, the shape of patterns and stuff in the class is about to pivot a little bit as we get towards the end. Um, lecture topics are going to be on the universal principles of design, specifically talking about Gestalt theory and the psychology of perception, and then um, more universal, universal principles of design talking about neuroaesthetics. Um, we're going to review uh, the projects from week eight as normal, and then we are going to do the class activity, uh, which is creating a pattern language. Um, and that will be, uh, we're gonna go over using pattern language for game design, a couple of parts of that you may not have done yet. And then we're going to work on compiling and linking our patterns together because we've created a good number of them now. Um, and we want to connect them and connect them to some of the patterns that exist in the library uh, as is appropriate. Your project uh, for this week, you're going to be picking a design problem for your final project and then uh, identifying and deriving patterns to solve that problem um individually and um that will be a little different than what we've done before so we'll get to that in class all right so uh gestalt theory the uh the unified whole so gestalt theory is 1920s psychological theory about human perception um it's interesting that it's from the 1920s but it's still something that we're talking about today uh because it's pretty useful and it's easy to demonstrate how effective it is um we can we can show you that it's a, a thing that is real right uh, we'll do that in a minute so it was created by um max wertheimer um kurt kafka uh different kafka and uh wolf came kohler um so there were initially five or six principles but uh some places now when you'll look at it you'll see as many as 15. um the links below are to a couple of those lists so i recommend looking through the extended list there's a bunch of cool images that you're like oh huh yeah i guess we do work that way in our brains um so take a look at those but uh, we'll walk through a few now all right so one of the the principles of gestalt theory is similarity so we like to group things together when we look at this set of um of squares we say oh that's a group of them right they're all connected but also oh look there's a group of gray squares and the group of green squares like our brains separate those out categorize them and organize the information in that way based on the patterns that we're seeing how about that um now uh continuation the eye tends to follow the smoothest path so even though we have these two different colors of dots you're like aha there's a straight line and there's a curved line and they intersect right um even though uh you know the red dots go in one path and the uh, other ones go on the other path you know you could imagine those being two lines that are um kinked in the middle as opposed to two intersecting lines but our brains tend to go more in the uh the intersecting uh path following the two different smooth curves or straight lines cool um closure so that is we connect the dots right complete we um, complete shapes by filling in gaps in them so that is not actually a picture of a square a circle and a triangle it's a picture of a bunch of uh, dotted lines uh you know that are either curved or uh, angled but we you know complete those shapes without any trouble there's there's unlikely that anybody in the class is like what do you mean that there's a square a circle and a triangle we our brains put things together uh very happily in that way and that's something that we can use, understanding that people are going to do that. Um, we group projects by proximity to each other, uh, projects, uh, objects by proximity to each other. So, you know, we see, ah, there is a group of dots or, or there are three groups of dots because of how they're spaced in relationship to each other. Um, so we can, we can make use of that as well. Uh, figure and ground is a little bit harder, but it, uh, it's a, you know you get cool illusions like this where like is that a picture of a tree or it is it a picture of a lion and a gorilla um and some fish and so on so um we have the tendency to um i mean one so you can you can have clever compositions like this but what we're really talking about is the fact that there are two different images there one is formed by the figure the black 
the other, um, you know, by the ground, the, the white, the background, right? So if you're looking at the figure formed by one, you get a tree. And if you're looking at the figure formed by the other, you get the, uh, the animals. So when you're making a game, recognize that people tend to only see one of those at a time. So if you're doing more than one of those things, um, if you're uh, wanting to draw the player's attention to the figure, the architecture, say, in the foreground, um, they're probably not going to notice what's happening in the background. Um, if you want to draw their attention to what's going on in the background, they're going to miss some of what's going on in the foreground. And you can use that to surprise them, right? Like you have lightning flashing in the background that's really drawing their attention and stuff's happening in the foreground that they're not supposed to notice. You're setting them up for, you know, some like something to suddenly be near them that they weren't expecting. Um, so you can make use of that in very clever ways. Um, to draw people's attention into different uh, depths uh, in the world in order to um, direct their experience. Cool. All right, moving on to neuroaesthetics. Um, neuroaesthetics is the study of the brain, of brain chemistry and uh, relating that to our perception. So looking at something like, you know, what is beauty? Well, you know, rather than saying, let's describe beauty, we say, uh, let's show people something that we or they find beautiful and then look at their brain and see what's going on there and trying to say ah that is how we perceive beauty on a physiological level um and then we can monitor that and be like ah this person finds this thing beautiful even though they aren't saying that out loud we understand that that's what's going on inside of their mind um so it's a pretty cool thing you also have people responding to it um, saying neuroaesthetics is killing your soul, right? Like studying these things is, you know, uh, getting in the way of actually being able to appreciate them uh, in the world around us. So you know, that's true to a degree. Um, but if you're interested in trying to create experiences for people, which we do in games all the time, then studying how they're actually perceiving them, what's really going on in their minds is uh, a fascinating uh, field of study. And so, you know, if you're interested in the academic side of game design um, or, you know, the ac academic side of designing spaces and experiences, whether or not they're in games, this is one way you can go. Um, and if you're not, you might want to consider finding people on your for your team who are into that, who are interested and informed um of those fields of study because uh they can prove whether or not what you're doing is actually effective um and when millions of dollars of game budget are, are at stake you know those kind of uh those kind of metrics become very attractive all right so final project uh we are now moving into the final project right you've done all of these little one week long projects where it's like you know crunch 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 get get it out you know as fast as you can uh, make it happen. Well, now we have a little time. Um, so the project we're working on now is going to be more fleshed out, right? You're going to have more time to get the mechanics working. I'm going to expect not just gray boxing, but things to be, you know, uh, first do your gray boxing, but then things to be textured, things to be lit, um, you know, for as, as much as possible, avoiding using uh, pre-made assets uh, where they relate directly to your pattern. Um, in support of your pattern in the background, that's fine, but like more done yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, you're really going to need to have your uh, character dropped into the world so you can walk through it and demonstrate the effectiveness of your pattern. Um, this final project, you're not just going to be create, being, you know, given a single pattern or two to create to build your project. Uh, project. You're going to be given a um, a problem, you're going to be um, given the ability to choose a problem and then to select a bunch of patterns from all the ones that have been created in the class by previous classes from the book, finding all the patterns that are going to help you address the design problem you have, um, and then choosing a subset, and you don't have to use all of them, but choosing five to maybe seven patterns that will work together that you can, that will help you solve that design problem, and then implementing those and showing me here's where each of these patterns that we selected is present in our design. Um, and here's whether or not it, it worked to solve the design problem. You know, you may try implementing a pattern into your game and say, wow, this actually isn't working the way we expected. 
that's okay. You need to note that. Um, you know, this one really helped us uh, focus and address our design problem. Um, so you're going to be combining a lot more patterns. But first week, you're just going to be working on combining all of your patterns together and connecting them so you know which ones you should and shouldn't be using together. Um, you're going to be selecting your design problem, and then you're going to start choosing problems that you help uh, you think will, um, sorry, patterns that you think will help solve the problem. You're not going to be starting your design in the first week. I'm going to say this a couple times in class too. Um, you don't start your design until several weeks into this process. You're first defining your problem, creating your pattern language, and then moving on to actually doing design. Do not say, hmm, here's my design problem. This is what my level is going to be. Let me pick some patterns I can justify. That's wrong, not how you're going to do it. Um, second week, you're going to start actually preparing your design um, and then you're going to be using the parents and children patterns that you've um, selected to try to find more patterns that may help you out. Third week, you're going to be adding keywords to the patterns. Uh, I know you've already added lots of them because there's a, a good selection, but you're going to be looking at keywords that weren't present, but that should be adding them to your patterns and then using those keywords to search across the other patterns in the group to see if there's any you've missed that you should be including. In your third week, you're finally going to begin developing your scene. So you won't start doing your actual uh, in-engine work for three weeks, right? So you have a bunch of time not to slack off, not to like not do things. There's going to be deliverables each week, just like there have been. I'm going to expect as much work each week as you've been doing, but that work is going to be broken into more stages and I'm going to expect more depth in each of the things that you turn in. Um, week four, you're finally going to be completing your scene development. So you go two weeks in engine to be working on the things. Um, you'll be working on finalizing your design document. And then at the end of the, the fifth week, you'll be turning in uh, your team assignments uh, and documents. Um, the dates here may shift a little bit because there's some weird stuff going on in terms of you being given a rest week. Uh, I just saw some emails about that and, um, you know, we're going to figure out what the best way to address that is. I would really like to keep the two classes in sync, and that probably means having uh, the class that's affected by the rest day attend the second class so that we can keep on schedule um, and move things forward. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit. I want to see where everyone is, uh, if that's really going to prevent you from getting the rest and mental health that you need then we can talk about shifting things around. Um, but I think it will make things more complicated for everyone. And I'd really like to have us end uh, after the 15th of April, giving you more time to focus on your finals rather than cramming uh, final development in this project that could get in the way of that. So um, that's how that is going to go. Just a really quick walk through the rest of the slides you'll be seeing in class so you know it's coming. Um, we'll do our show and tell as usual of this week's project. We're going to uh, do the readings and discussion. There'll be a lot more on this slide when you see it next. Um, you'll be looking at the project assignment. Again, you're not going to start designing your game this week. You're just going to be doing uh, selecting the design problem and you know each of the steps listed there. So I've, I've broken it out in some detail. Um, again, we're going to do an exercise where you have some time to pick your design problem. Um, we're going to do the compiling, linking, and indexing. So we're going to be connecting the patterns together. Then you're going to be doing the general pattern exercise, right? Which is the, uh, the uh, exercise one from the textbook, using that to create patterns that are missing uh, from your project or that, you know, uh, that, are, that are missing. So we'll go over how, how we're going to do that. That will be individual. So you're going to end up with uh, a larger set of patterns there. Um, and then uh, the reading again, uh, one paragraph, uh, recommended reading um, is going to be, actually, no, there isn't recommended reading, but you are going to need to read um, the uh, architectural approach to level design chapter 10. Um, and then um, the pattern language for game design, uh, there isn't a recommended reading because uh, it's just the general pattern. <clears throat> um, exercises, again, you're going to work on 20 in class and at home, and then you're going to use exercise 21 to create new patterns needed for your project. You may or may not start an exercise 21 during class. 
uh, depending on how far you get um, with uh, selecting your design problem and figuring out what patterns you can use or what patterns you can find to use um, without them all being linked together as they will be later. Um, and again, you're going to complete the project assignment from the previous slide. Um, note that next week there is going to be a deliverable in terms of you all uh, saying what patterns you added and sharing them and uh, you're sharing your uh, design problems. So there is still going to be work due next week, even though your final project isn't going to be turned in at the end. All right, that is pretty much where we are. So uh, I am going to stop the recording and see you all in class.